Welcome to Truth in History, where we will discover together how history becomes prophecy in the making, and prophecy reflects history as it's being fulfilled. Now, here's your host, Pastor Charles Jennings. Greetings once again in the name of the Lord as we come into your home or place of business or wherever you may be watching this program. And we pray that it will be a blessing to you because that's our purpose. Coming to you in the name of the Lord, sharing the good word of God. And I realize after being involved in this ministry for several years, I'll share this with this audience. There are hundreds of people, many of them have contacted us and said that they love God, they love the Lord, they read His Word, they pray, they live right, but they have quit church. They quit attending church for various reasons. Some of the reasons that have been expressed to us, and that is the contemporary music. A lot of people could not tolerate that any longer. And the churches that people have built through their attendance and their gifts over the years, many, many years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, these same people are being more or less pushed in the background and the emphasis is now towards the youth. The youth need to be saved, but so do older people need to be saved and edified. Another reason that folks have quit church, and that is they said that they like the singing, if it's if it's singing that is compatible with them. But there's no substance in the sermons. They said, we're not learning anything. We go to church week after week and all we hear is, a, is a, maybe a 15 or 20 minute sermon or maybe a, a longer sermon. It could be a report on a television program that the preacher saw the week before. Some of them give a report on this survival program that's on TV or um, Star Wars or some other program or a fishing trip that the preacher had been involved in or some kind of committee meeting that he had met with and, and involved in and gave a report on that but very little, if anything, from God's Word. And therefore, people have told us, many, many people, they quit. So, part of our focus and purpose for bringing you these lessons is to stay with the Word of God, be honest with the Word of God, try to present to you the full counsel of God as we understand it and as the Lord has revealed it to us. Because, and to be honest, if it goes against church tradition, it just simply goes against church tradition. If it goes against the popular trend of thought that the body of Christ have, has gotten into lately, that is too bad. Truth matters. I want to know God's Word in its purity. If it goes against my best friend, I still want to know truth. We have been talking about putting old wine into new bottles. Simply this. Jesus was speaking in a time in which Judaism was paramount. It was 
the main religion of the day in the nation of Judah. And Jesus came along and says, I'm not going to blend my message with the message of the old rabbis. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to blend Judaism with Christianity. And I know that the phrase is so popular among many people today. Judeo-Christianity. America was not based, our founding fathers did not base this nation and the documents of this nation and the foundations of this nation upon Judeo-Christianity. They based it upon Christianity because they took principles out of the Old Testament and out of the New Testament, but it doesn't mean that the Old Testament is Jewish. Someone may challenge me, they may call me crazy. It's Israelitish, but it's not Judaism. Judaism is that religion that came out of Babylon, out of the Babylonian exile. Check with the, your Jewish encyclopedia, and out of that exile came their writings called the Talmud, which was, has been added to over the years. So we must know what we're talking about when we get so involved in trying to put new wine into the old, an old religion of Judaism or even trying to bring the two sacrificial systems together. Let me read this and we'll go to our lesson today. No man puts a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. Verse 17, Matthew chapter 9, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, otherwise the bottles break. The wine runs out, the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. We're talking about the manifestation of God, which was visible in the Old Testament. And it was audible. And the first example we see in Genesis 15 with Abraham. And then the next example that we see was Moses at the burning bush. The third example was Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. God made himself visible and audible. And then the fourth one was at <clears throat> the building and the sanctifying of the tabernacle of Moses, which was the anointing for priestly authority. Then the temple of Solomon, number five, fire, cloud, and the voice of God to Solomon. That was the anointing of kingly authority. And the Lord said, I'm going to put my name in that house forever. But let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and we read these words. 1 Kings 18, we see another manifestation of the glory of God. And that's in the life of the prophet Elijah. 1838, 1 Kings 18, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. In other words, Yahweh, the one and true God of Israel, Yahweh is God. Yahweh, He is the God. And then... The hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he outran the chariot of King Ahab. And he said, there is coming a rain. You see, out of that glory, 
there was a manifestation that Yahweh, or God, He is the only rightful God in Israel. The Lord is the only rightful God in Israel. This was the anointing of a prophetic authority. First, a priestly authority. Second, it was a kingly authority for civil government. And then this one is a prophetic authority. All anointed, all uh, authenticated by the manifestation of fire. Now, what about Isaiah's vision? We find this recorded in Isaiah chapter number 6. We read these words. Isaiah 6. Verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And His train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Here is Isaiah's vision of the glory of the Lord. And the house was filled with smoke. And then we see the response of this young man, Isaiah, who says, Woe is me, I'm unclean, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? First, in this vision, there was the manifestation of the person of Jesus Christ on the throne. You say, are you sure that was Jesus Christ on the throne? Was that who Isaiah saw? How do you know? In the book of John, chapter number 12, we read these words. Verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Jesus is referring to himself and telling that crowd that day, I was the one that Isaiah saw, because the very words that Isaiah saw as recorded in chapter 6 of his book were being fulfilled in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, These things spake Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So we see this is an anointing upon Isaiah, a call upon Isaiah. And this message that God gave Isaiah was actually a declaration of the doom that would come to the Judah nation, that Jerusalem hierarchy in 70 AD. The doom that would come to them. Why? Because the book of Luke tells us so. In the book of Luke, chapter 19, we read 
these strong words. Luke 19, and I want to read between verses 41 and 44. Now, before I read this, I want to go back to a scripture in 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings 21. And if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me to these verses. 1 Kings chapter 21. And this is talking about the sin and the corruption that had been brought into the city of Jerusalem by King Manasseh. Now earlier, I want to make this very clear, earlier when the temple was dedicated by Solomon, the Lord said, I'm going to put my name there forever. I'm going to put my name there forever. 1 Kings 9, 3. But in 2 Kings 21, 7, we read this. And he set a graven image, talking about Manasseh. He set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house. Now this graven image of the grove was phallic worship. It was a symbol of the male reproductive organ that they had carved out of a tree. It's phallic worship. Phallic worship is still practiced by some ethnic people in the far east. And it's heathenism. It is hedonism, a religion of sinful pleasure. That's all. And there's implications of it even in the Western world, but in a very polished manner. Some of these television programs that some of you people may watch is based upon phallic worship and hedonism and sexual pleasure. And like these programs where some of the men and the women are, are very scantily clothed. Why? Why do they have to do that? You might say, well, it's, it's just entertainment. No, my friends, it's a religion. And some church people, I'm absolutely appalled at some of the church meetings or conventions that I go to where people come like they're dressed for a skunk party. They have no realization in their spirit man or in their mind that they're meeting with the body of Christ or part of the body of Christ. And I know a building is just a material building, but it's the house of the Lord when the body of Christ meets there. But yet some people have no respect or very little respect for the house of God. But anyway, 2 Kings 21, 7. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house, of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, would I put my name forever. But he said forever. But yet when we turn to 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse number 26, we read these words. Notwithstanding, now it's a different king now. Now it's King Josiah. King Josiah was a, a righteous man. He had instituted the feast of Passover. He had cleaned out the Sodomites out of the temple. 
and he had actually made repairs on the physical building. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Ju Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, catch this, And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, My name shall be there. Now, because of the grossness of the sins of Judah, ancient Judah, the Lord said, I will cast off this city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is no longer the city of God. I know, that's a shocker. You can't believe that somebody said that on television. But God's word is that I will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house, that means Solomon's temple, which I said, my name shall be there. It's no longer God's house. God was there at one time, but you can't fence God in. You can only fence where He's been. And ministry today, Christian ministries are going over there and, and reaping thousands of dollars, telling people that Jesus is going to come back there and that Jesus is going to live in a, a material, physical house that somebody's going to be built, building, and some of the Jewish organizations over there are trying to build this temple. God cast off that city, and He cast off that temple that His name was once dwelling in. That's the Word of God. Now, we see this in Luke chapter 19. Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And Jesus was the grand visitor. Jesus is weeping over the city. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy that we just read that God gave to Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 23. Jesus is weeping over this city of Jerusalem, and He said, the Romans are going to come in here and cast a, a trench about thee and destroy thee and lay thee level with the ground. Now, remember Matthew 24? Jesus said, Look at this great temple. The apostles were enthralled with this wonderful place, wonderful edifice that Herod had built. Well, he built a lot of other buildings also. But Jesus said, not one stone is going to be left upon another. Why go over there and pray at the Wailing Wall? There are Christians today taking their little prayer requests and writing it on a, people, uh, on a piece of paper and sticking it in the cracks or the crevices of that wall. What's the point? We have access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ and His precious shed blood because Jesus has overcome death. He has paid the price for sin. He sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Why do we need to put our prayer request in a crack in the wall in Jerusalem somewhere? My friends, be careful. Don't get caught up 
in the big thrust that is going on, this egregious movement of trying to put new wine into old bottles. That temple, that temple, every physical temple or tabernacle that we see in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, God allowed it to be destroyed. Why? Even Solomon said, Lord, you are too big to dwell in the temple made with hands. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, he made that same statement. The Lord is too big to live or to be confined in a temple made with hands. The Holy Land is no longer holy. The Holy Land is no longer holy. You know why? The Holy One is not there. Jesus Christ is the Holy One. As I said, I'm not going to praise an ungodly people, whoever they may be. Neither am I going to put spiritual and holy, sanctimonious, pious significance to a piece of real estate when God has already moved on. Remember where you were saved? Maybe that church no longer exists, but it doesn't matter because you cannot fence God in. You can only fence where He has been and build a shrine to that. If you have never received a copy of our magazine, I encourage you to write to us, Truth and History magazine. We will be glad to send it to you free of charge. We will not make money solicitations from you either by phone or by mail. We just trust the Lord because He's the one whom we preach. He's the one that is all sufficient and He has a bountiful supply. Hallelujah. Thank God. But I want to encourage everyone today that if you've never accepted to the Lord Jesus, accept Him today. If you're sick, if you're frail, if you're going through some legal court trial or something and you need an advocate, Jesus Christ is your greatest lawyer. He's your greatest attorney because He is everything. He is the great I Am. I am that I am is what He told Moses. So He is all sufficient. He is our all sufficient one. God bless you as you press on in Him to know Him in a greater and greater way. God bless you. Amen. For any material offered on this program, please write or call for your copy today. May God bless you for your response and for being a part of this end-time ministry.